Well, these guys are a fixture of every Monster Palooza convention because we love so much what they do. So let's have a really big Monster Palooza welcome for Chris Williams and John Murdy. What time is it? <laughs> Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Hey, hey, hey. Thanks for coming out. I'm John Murdy. I'm creative director, executive producer of Halloween Horror Nights. Chris I'm Chris Williams. I'm our director, production designer of Halloween Horror Nights. Hey, for you that came last year, thank you so much. We're looking forward to putting a great, awesome, better product out this year for you guys, too. Guaranteed. Cool. Um, I see there's still people coming in, so I designed today's presentation. So you guys know we're going to announce something today? So if you're coming in, don't worry. Because <laughs> we're going to do that in the second half of the presentation. Because I know there's always people filtering in and you'd be super pissed if I announced something and you're like, what? Um, so we're going to do kind of two things today. Uh, what Chris and I are going to do is uh, we're going to spend the first half of the presentation talking a little bit in depth behind the scenes about a maze we did last year. And then we're going to switch gears about halfway through the presentation and we're going to talk about a maze we're going to do this year. Is that all right with you? Woo! Right on. Um, so what I, what I like to do with Twitter, for everybody who follows us at, at Horror Nights, um, about a week or so before we, I came out for Monster Palooza, I, I started asking questions, and I asked a specific question. What was your favorite maze of 2018, and what questions are you dying to ask us about it? So I did a little survey on Twitter, everybody had their input, and what was cool is like every single maze got mentioned by somebody at least once, but there was one maze that got more questions than any other. Could you guys guess what it is? I'm gonna see how good you guys are. What maze? Trick or treat, keep going. That's right. It's Monster Palooza, right? right? How could we not talk about Universal Monsters and Monster Palooza? Um, so, I asked people to submit their questions. There were some great questions this year. So some of you guys, you know, if you're here today live, you'll see your name up here. We'll give you credit for your questions. Um, but the first question that I want to talk about is, this is from Rusty Shackelford at LovesickPT5. What was your thought when you found out you were going to do it maze based on the Universal Monsters? <laughs> I'm going to turn it to Chris. That's pretty appropriate, right? That was about right. Um, you know, this is something that John and I have talked about for, honestly, uh, many, years. Years, <laughs> many, many, many years. And, you know, we, we kind of were looking for a really kind of a right timing and window, you know, for us to, uh, you know, really try to pull this off. Um, and what I mean by pulling it off, you'll see later how we've gone through the whole process on this. Um, but... Uh, I'll be honest with you, I was really thrilled to do it. You know, I did a little couple versions in the 90s. Did anybody go to those, by the way? You know, Chris, before you know, he and I hooked up and started bringing back Horror Nights in 2006, you know, Halloween Horror Nights in Hollywood had a life before that back in the 90s. Chris, did all those mazes? Do you, anybody that goes all the way back to the 90s? Probably not very many. Wow. But we had done uh, ago, a it? couple versions of them, even in uh, black and white, but we played it pretty straight. Um, and, and, you know, we took that approach at that time, and that was about 20 years ago or so. And I think it's fair to say, like, every year, you know, when Chris and I are trying to come up with what we're going to do working with our marketing team, you know, what properties we want to feature for the event, we always have a list. It might be like 20, 30, sometimes 40 properties on the board. Every year that property has been on the board, and every year that both of us have taken it off. Yeah. And, you know, the, the reason was, and it's, it's really what you see up on the screen right now, um, Honestly, personally, I was terrified to do it. And there's a good reason for that. Um, and Chris and myself, we are lifelong Universal Monster fans. That's, um, that's me. <laughs> that's my fourth birthday with the Aurora Monster model of you know, the Wolfman sitting next to me. Uh, the picture you see with um, 
that rather odd dressed wolfman that looks a lot more like I was a teenage werewolf than the Universal Wolfman is um, that's taken at Universal Studios in Hollywood in 1972. And that's me going, I love you. I love you. <laughs> I love how he's holding his paw. <laughs> I love that. Can you imagine the poor actor who played him? I was like following him around the whole day. So, Wolfman, could, hey Wolfman, you know, and he was just like, kid, leave me alone. Um, but, you know, we, we started out lifelong fans of this, of this property. Um, so you have all of that baggage, you know. Also, you know, I think some of you guys know I have, I have like one of the biggest collections of memorabilia from these films, like toys and stuff, in my, in my house. I have a monster room in the attic of my house here in California. Um, and my kids have, are also monster fans. They've grown up in, in the monster. That's them. That's my daughter Izzy when she was just a little baby. The she, the first word you know she ever said, I think it was like mommy or daddy. And then the next one was phantom. And then the next one, not kidding, was Frankie and Wolfie. And she knew all of the names of the Universal monsters. And they've literally grown up with the monsters. And they're critics. You know, they watch the YouTube videos of the mazes every year that Chris and I designed. And they're very critical. So I had to live up to that too. Um, when I left California, because I live in Ireland now, um, to come and, and build this maze with Chris, I left them this note, and this is like the promise I made, you know, that Daddy has to go build a home for the Universal Monsters. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a true story. My wife literally, when I said, hey, I'm thinking about doing the Universal Monsters, she said, don't do it. And I said, why? And she goes, it's going to break your heart. Because you love this more than anything else in this world. This is your favorite, favorite thing. And if it's not a success, it's going to break your heart. So you shouldn't do it. And then Chris and I looked at each other and we I said... I felt like that too, in a sense. Yeah. Because, you know, we would put it on a list and, you know, and, and essentially, you know, we're running a risk. You know, this is our own property. We want this to really be the best one and really sing and, and uh, knock it out of the park. I, I think we did that, but, um, you know, we did run a risk uh, in our mind, like a creative risk, you know? And it kind of flows into the next question that was asked on Twitter by Christopher Ripley. When redesigning possibly Universal's most iconic characters, did you have any trepidation? And were you or Universal more protective of these characters' design than perhaps any other Universal character? Absolutely. Yeah, we had a heck of a lot of trepidation, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, these films, when you think about it, looking at like the earliest ones, like Hunchback and Phantom, we're getting pretty close to the 100-year anniversary of these movies. These movies have been around a really long time. There's this amazing legacy, and there's also all of these people that are fans of this franchise that we have to live up to. Um, and then, to, you know, these gentlemen. Do you guys know who these gentlemen are? Can you recognize them? Yell them out if you can. Yeah, in the middle, that's Jack Pierce. He was Universal's makeup artist that designed all of the classic monster characters. And you know, if you know anything about classic horror, most of these people, the, the end of their life was not happy. You know, all of these characters, and the, not only the actors for the most part that portrayed them, but the people who made these movies, you know, they didn't get the recognition. They didn't have Monster Palooza back in the 1930s. Jack Pierce ended his career doing Mr. Ed, the television show of the talking horse. That's what he ended up doing. That was his last gig in Hollywood. Um, the gentleman standing next to the stand-in for Frankenstein, that's director James Whale. Uh, James Whale directed Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, The Invisible Man. Uh, he ended his life by committing, swimming, you know, committing suicide in his swimming pool in, the Holly, in Hollywood. You know, that, that's what I mean. These guys, there's like this huge legacy of these people that never got the credit when they were alive, that deserve the credit. And then the last person is Carl Lemley Jr. He was the son of Carl Lemley who founded Universal Studios. And he's the guy who produced all of these movies. And when Universal lost control of the studio back in the 30s, when the Lemleys no longer were in charge of it, um, that, that was it for him. He never made another movie for the rest of his life. He lived into the 1970s. He was pretty much a recluse. So we felt this great, you know, kind of burden to pay homage not only to the great performers that were in these movies, the great legacy of these movies, but the people who made them. Uh, and then you have to talk about Universal, you know, and going back as early as, you know, when the studio tour started in the mid-60s, Frankenstein was always like the mascot of Universal. Do you guys remember that? If you, anybody yeah. who's like my age coming to Universal? Okay, let's see how well you remember this, because I brought some good pictures with me. Do you remember this? Frankenstein Jr. He was the unofficial mascot of the studio back in the, like, early 1970s. And, you know, and this is where things start to get weird. Because these movies in the 20s and 30s and 40s, when people first saw Frankenstein, they went running and screaming from the theaters, right? But by the time you get around to like this, I found this picture in our archive. 
Check it out. Frankenstein, two goats, and the bird from Beretta. <laughs> Nothing says Christmas like Frankenstein, two goats, and the bird from Beretta. This was an advertisement that Universal did in the 70s for Christmas. You know, now we do this big, huge Christmas event every year, but that was it back in the 70s. So the point of why I'm showing these images is they start out scary, but over time, they start to lose it, you know? And get soft. And then, you know, you get into the consumer products, and you get things like, you know, Phantom and Dracula is as like WWE wrestlers and you know those skateboard guys those are called monster thrashers you know um, and you know the Sokies that were bath toys back in the 60s um, after a, a long period of time they no longer had the power to scare people and that's what Chris and I really had to do so the next question is how much of a challenge was it to take the classic monsters and make them scary for an audience that is jaded when it comes to old style horror horror and this is from a uh, Christian Balder and that, in essence, I mean, right? Yes, there it is. A, a lot of people, like, that's their image, you know, of Frankenstein. It's like this kind of cute thing. Um, and that was Chris and I's challenge. And what we're going to talk about right now is the philosophy that we took in approaching it, you know, as far as how do we turn these characters not only and pay homage to the great legacy of them, but make them scary to a modern-day audience. And, you know, we just didn't want to... Um forgive me for saying that Van Helsing eyes them in a sense, you know? We, we, we wanted to take and like look at them differently and take a original classic look and then really just work upon that to make them scary. Trying to keep something still simple um, but yet visually impactive like what we're going to see. And really the starting point was the source material itself. Not only the books like, you know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein where the story came out of, but the original films. And when you really look at the core of these films, the source material is scary. I mean, what is Frankenstein? He's, you know, like the pictures you see on the screen right now. Dr. Frankenstein, you know, went and dug up all these bodies, these criminals that were executed, took them back to the lab, stitched them together, jolted them to life electricity, and threw them into the world. You know, that's the source material of Frankenstein. And um, when you look at certain scenes, like this scene to me is probably scarier than any scene in any horror movie. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. This is Maria, the little girl who's throwing flowers, you know, throwing daisies in the lake and the monster comes along and he plays a game with her and they run out of flowers and then he picks her up and hucks her in the lake. And then the next thing you see is the dad carrying her drowned body. I mean, that's child murder. <laughs> that's terrifying. So we knew that the essence of the stories was scary unto themselves. The question was, how are we going to take that essence and then tease out things that were inherent to the characters, but that would be scary for a modern-day audience? And this is a good example. Yeah, this image on the right of uh, Walking Dead, I believe. Yeah, it's yeah, like Walker a from Walking Walker, Dead. You know, so you can see where we're heading with this. And, and you know, we're looking at the approach from uh, Bright Frankenstein. Yeah. Know, and, and that, we felt that taking that approach uh, was more scary. So this was our original concept art for what to do with Frankenstein, so we wanted to play up the aspect at the end of the first film, he's trapped in the windmill, he's badly burned, and you see that look at Jack Pierce's makeup in The Bride of Frankenstein. So we just wanted to push that, make it a little bit more extreme. Yeah, we had like a couple, I think, kind of, in a sense, phases of design. Yeah, this was the initial one, but then we hooked up with a guy yep. named Crash McCreary. Do you guys know Crash? Woo! Yeah, Crash is a concept artist for movies. He's worked on everything from you know, Edward Scissorhands, Design Jurassic of Scissorhands, Park. Jurassic Park, yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Crash came on board to work with us on this key art, but also to help us flesh out the design of some of these characters. So flat, uh, Crash kind of added this little twist to Frankenstein and showed those weird exposed teeth. Yeah, it's almost as though he had like a broken jaw, in a sense, or something. And then this is kind of our third design approach, or third phase, in a sense, where we're taking uh, the imagery and turning it into 3D. So this is through McGee Effects. And, and you can visit Patrick. He's here today at Monster Palooza. Pat McGee, McGee Effects, is our primary makeup artist that sculpts all of these characters for us. This is uh, this is their sculpt for Frankenstein's yeah. monster. Yeah. So you can you can see we're trying to get like a kind of a broken jaw, as well as kind of a a dead eye in there as well, and a really burnt and burnt to the extreme so much that we've got like exposed skull. Um, but at the point where you could see where the doctor had worked on that skull and had separated that at one point and put it back together and banded it up. 
So we did that across the board with all of the characters. All of them went through this filter, this design philosophy of start with the original, take what's iconic about the characters to begin with, to try not to lose that, and then tease out the more horrific elements of the story. Um, so this question, what monster were you most excited to bring to life and why? This is from Sincerely Sydney, And actually, uh, Chris and I both added what our favorites were to design. So I'm yeah, gonna let Chris start one. with this one. Yeah, this one, you know, um, I, I felt well, the characters had such a great look um, and uh, the direction that we were heading with them. It was really difficult for me to choose one, um, but you know, I really kind of thought long and hard and I kind of felt that our take and spin on the Dracula's Bride was really a, a good approach and felt what I felt was probably, you know, my favorite. And this is from the 1931, you know, original film, Dracula. So you can see if we just did this at Horror Nights, I don't think it would have scared anybody. So what we always do, Chris and I, is we do a lot of visual research. We pull a lot of images to inspire us. And these were two images that yeah. we used to inspire yeah. the design for the Dracula's Bride. Yeah, we were really trying to get, like, uh, the one on the right. We're trying to get, like, a showing veins more of a translucent skin quality to them, in a sense. You know, we're trying to get that... You know, that feeling of, you know, look, Dracula, vampire lore, blood is such a big deal. You know, we're trying to get that image, that look through the mask, in a sense, and with that picture from Carrie, you know, covered in blood. I mean, that says it to me that these vampire brides would just be constantly feasting. And I think that's the, the approach we were taking. And I remember one of the things we talked about, in particular with Dracula and the brides, was we wanted to treat blood like it was um, an addiction, really, because it really is, when you think about it. A vampire can't survive without blood, so I kept talking about, like, they're meth addicts, really. Um, because you know, like, how a meth addict will show the, the ravages of their addiction on their face? We wanted to do the same thing with Dracula and Dracula's Prize to show their addiction to yep. blood, you know, literally, physically on their face. So this is the concept art. Yeah, and this is by Lucas Coleshaw. So you can see where we're trying to get with the blood and um, also with, with their looks and the bat pointed ears and just really the, the horrific look on them. Um, you know, we're also kind of getting into printing fabrics and such versus uh, completely doing two-dimensional makeup on characters. So um, that is showing that as well, where we're printing fabric um, in respect to skin. Um, so, hit the next one, yeah. And this is the sculpt again, McGee effects. Mm -hmm. I think this sculpture actually was done by Jordi Shell, and uh, who's a well-known sculptor, um, but through Patrick. Um, so you can see here where we're creating some faux eyes within the mask, and then right above those eyes right within here. the uh, eyelids, we've got some slits cut that our performers can see through. So that way we can create any kind of, you know, horrific, crazy eye look that uh, we want or, you know, just keep them white or whatever, so. I think we started doing that with The Walking Dead. Yeah. If you've seen The Walking Dead attraction at Universal, we wanted that, like, glazed white zombie eye. And we didn't want to put actors in contacts because if you've ever worn effects contacts, you could do it for a few days in a row, but if it's a permanent attraction, that's just like, you know, torture to constantly be putting contacts in. Yeah. So that's the first time we developed this kind of fake eye look and then we used it quite a bit at Universal Monsters. And then this is the uh, final product. Yeah, and that's her popping out of uh, essentially a painting through the wall. Uh, good action shot. So I thought about mine too, and it's funny that Chris and I predict kind of like the, the, the less obvious ones we picked as our favorites. Um, mine was what we referred to in the maze as the Hunchback Assistant, but really what that character was was a combination of Fritz from the original um, Frankenstein and then uh, Igor from the son of Frankenstein. So we took the two kind of main assistant characters from those movies and kind of combined them into one. And again, you know, we did visual research and to me, the image I kept landing on was this guy. Do you guys know what this is? Dune, right, that's the Baron from Dune, Kenneth McMillan. And the reason I liked this particular image, beside the fact that it's disgusting, um, is I thought the character should be physically repellent. The character has physical deformities, obviously, being a hunchback, but I thought he needed an extra layer of, of you know, something that was just 
flat out wrong and bad about his face. So I just came across this image of Kenneth McMillan from Dune and I really liked the idea of these boils and pus. Um, so we added that to the character when we did the, creator, the, you know, the character design. This is Lucas's drawing of this character with his, you know, his pustules bursting. Uh, and then we gave it to Patrick McGee and he sculpted it. That's the sculpture. And then this is the final look. And again, this time we used just the one big fake eye uh, that the actor's looking through a tiny little slit just above him, just underneath the eyebrow. Next question, what was it like to work with Slash during the audio mixing process? Could you explain the steps you went through in order to achieve what you did? And the question comes to us from Theme Park Direct. Um, how'd you guys like Slash's score for Universal Monsters? Um, he was the first person I called. When I knew we were going to be doing this maze, my very first call uh, was to Slash. You know, Slash we met years ago, Black Sabbath. Yeah. He, he came to the park one day, I just got a call, and um, somebody up at Guest Relations said, hey, Slash is the Black Sabbath maze. You guys remember our Black Sabbath maze, 13? And uh, thank you. Um, and so I, I went up to the park, and he brought his, uh, Slash has two sons, and, and they, at that time they were right on the edge of whether they would, could handle Horror Nights or not. And this particular night, they, they, it was too much, you know? They had just come in the main park, you know, they, they didn't get, you know, more than a few steps in and, and saw what was going on, and the kids were a little bit freaked out. So I went up and talked to them, I said, hey, you know, I've never met you, nice to meet you. Um, here, why don't you come back, and, you know, I'll take you around, I'll show you the event. So I took him through Black Sabbath that year, we came out through the maze, once we got to the other side, he just turned around and said, I want to do this. How do I do this? And I was like, I don't think we're going to do a Guns N' Roses maze. You know, I was like thinking, what are we going to do? And he's like, I just, I just want to be involved in some way. And I was like, thought about it. And then the next year we did Clowns yeah. 3D, an original maze that Chris and I did. And I asked him to do the music. So he did the music for that. And then, uh, you know, we've seen him at the event every year. He comes and hang out, and catch up. Um, and then this year I was just like, would you be interested in doing Universal Monsters? And the reason is, that's an image of, uh, he and I were working in the studio. That's the studio. When you walk into Slash's recording studio, the first thing you see is a giant framed picture of Bride of Frankenstein. Because he's exactly like us. He grew up loving the Universal Monster characters. So I know the question was asking, you know, what was the detailed process we went through? It was actually really simple. I mean, I, I pulled some samples from like, you know, the original Franz Waxman scores for the movies, but I knew I wanted it to be contemporary. And I just handed it to him along with a gentleman that we work with named Stacy Gunalti. Um, Stacy does all of our sound design for Horror Nights, uh, oversees all of that. And Stacy uh, also was in a band for years called Carbon, Carbon 9, I believe. Yes. Uh, industrial kind of Nine Inch Nails type band here in LA. And I knew that Stacy would have the, the cool modern sensibility. Um, so I paired Stacy and Slash together, had just talked to him about what I was thinking, and I turned him loose. And, you know, uh, Slash wrote, I think, 19 pieces of music for Universal Monsters. And if you guys don't know this, uh, we did release it, it's an album. You can actually get it, you can get it on Spotify. Uh, there's all kinds of places you can get it online. But uh, we took like five of the tracks from Universal Monsters and it's on that album. And uh, as a bonus track, we did the, uh, the music he wrote for Clowns 3D uh, called Sweet Licks. And you can get that as well. All right, what maze in all the years, oh, sorry, my favorite maze in all the years I've attended HHN has to be Universal Monsters. What was your favorite scene and why? All right, Chris, this oh, yeah, is yours. Sorry. I really dug the uh, the lab sequence and with the effects, we were kind of like breaking into uh, new looks and new effects and really tying into LED and um, we're also utilizing um, a, some equipment that essentially tied in RGB lights um, and foggers and like force fog and so um, I hope when you went through that sequence in the lab, um, you were able to see the lab essentially, you know, take it down and starting to fire up and blow up. Because every time I walked through, when I saw Frankenstein's monster, you know, I'm I'm pulling my arm down, you know, pull like, uh, you know, hey, Mr. Trucker, you know, honk your horn um, for him to pull the lever, you know, so I can make sure obviously the sequence is working, but also that I can 
enjoyed it too, actually. So, so it was a whole program audio lighting sequence. So when Frankenstein pulled the switch, just like in Bride of Frankenstein, it triggered the audio saying, we belong dead. And then it caused all of the equipment in the lab to start chasing and doing all these effects. And it also, uh, there's a special kind of fog machine slash intelligent light fixture called a maniac. And when you fire it off, it looks like an explosion. So all of that was tied together. Uh, the, the research images, aside from the old Kenneth Strick Fadden effects from the original Frankenstein film, that bizarre mess of wire, that's like, I think that's um, Calcutta in India. That's how they do, like, you know, that's how they hook up your cable. So we pulled these images and we thought, oh, it should look like a mess. Because if a mad scientist was trying to make a lab, it wouldn't be neat and tidy. So we used that as inspiration. Um, this is just one of the elevations from Chris's drawing package that shows the plan. I think the windows were like a key thing you keyed off of. Yeah, you know, we were trying to capture that specific look at the time. I think it was Dadaism, I think, in Germany at that yeah, time. Yeah, a lot well. of it was, and yeah, Dali, Dadaism. Yeah, so you can see uh, kind of that specific look, you know. So we were trying to capture that and, and really trying to bring it back to a classic feel so you can feel like you're right in the midst of that lab. And then, of course, there was yeah. the bride herself, which is a special effects illusion. You can describe yeah, how this another did this one. One of our table gags that you guys have experienced before. And, um, you know, it, it, this is really um, kind of how really detailed our props team gets, you know, because we fabricated this table and essentially the body parts on that, you know, were exactly like um, our, our, our drawing. This is another like Lucas Coleshaw drawing, but uh, but you know w what we're really trying to do, and what John and I try to do is um, our to our design phase really communicate exactly what we're trying to get out of the field. So honestly, there's less questions. It's exactly we want that. And the idea behind this was that Dr. Frankenstein was in a hurry, yep. and he didn't quite finish the bride. So that's why you see her in this state where she's partially assembled. Uh, and then there, that's the final, yeah. that's the final product. That's a, a picture of the actual maze when you're going through. Um, the scene I picked was actually a scene we called the banquet room. It was also called the blood feast. And this is where the vampire brides that Chris talked about earlier, this is where they existed. This is all visual research I pulled for Chris to inspire the design of the sequence. Um, we thought that if there was a manor house, like a, you know, like Frankenstein's castle, that there's always a grand banquet hall. So I pulled images of old castles. Uh, luckily, like I said, I live in Ireland now, so there's, I, I just go around all the time with my cell phone taking pictures and sending them to Chris, because there's all kinds of stuff like that all over the place. I also really like the idea of these windows and the bats flying outside, and just like a crazy Manson level of blood. Um, this is Chris's original elevation and ground plan for that scene. Um, and they had a lot of vacuform panels. I think I'm right about that, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. We used uh, a lot of dimensional stonework in here and also dimensional woodwork, you know, that we're honestly getting into to show the grain and to really uh, um, give a good look and feeling to like old world look, you know, so. And this is the, the final product. Um, outside those two windows were big, large video displays. So we had kind of a blood red sky that was a bit inspired by like Bram Stoker's Dracula that Francis Ford Coppola did. Yeah. Um, so you saw bats flying out the windows. Um, um, in, a, in a strange way, it was beautiful. <laughs> Every time I would walk into that scene, I would, I would just sit there and, and just kind of soak up the, the beauty of it because it just was a beautiful piece of art direction and set decoration from our props and dressing crew. Uh, but then the table itself was a bloody mess. Um, and then fulfilling that promise I made, you know, I said, I, you know, before I left Ireland and left that note for my kids and said, you know, daddy's going to make a home for the monsters. So I brought him out for Halloween and, you know, that's the girls posing with Wolf, <laughs> the wolf man. <laughs> but, um, did you draw the monster? I did. At the bottom of the. It's promise. a good thing I didn't design it for the maze, huh? <laughs> it would have, it would have had like a much more like Pokemon kind of feel to it. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not an artist, he's the artist, you know. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, the really cool thing was, you know, I think, you know, Monsters uh, was just embraced by our fans. Yep. Uh, every week it was just killing it in the ratings. We do surveys every night in the event with all of our guests. Um, and, it, and it just hit it out of the park. It's one of the highest rated mazes we've ever done. Um, so being a 
lifelong fan of the Universal Monsters. Yeah, same here. Uh, I was so happy that you, the fans, and everybody else who came to Horror Nights last year embraced it. Yes, uh, thank Because you. that was like, you know, I, of all the things we've done, I don't think I was more nervous about any maze than doing Universal Monsters, so thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> One last question before we get into the new stuff. Somebody asked whether there any Easter eggs that we put in the maze. You know, we, we like to plant Easter eggs, you know, that are references to other things. Or sometimes we'll use props from movies if we're allowed to. This is from Liz Allen. Uh, yeah, there was two very specific Easter eggs. There was a ton of, if you went in that film vault scene in the beginning, you know, you, you saw a sign right as you came into Frankenstein's castle that said the vault, and then we twisted it and made it a film vault. If you looked at all the cans of film, like, almost every Universal Monster movie that was made, the names of all of them were on those cans. But in this room, which was called the collection room, there are two pieces that were actually movie props. Um, and I think you acquired them years ago, didn't you? Yeah, there might be a couple more in there, too. There, well, I, I recognize the big scorpion thing. That's from Scorpion King, right? Correct. With The Rock. Yeah. That's an actual movie prop that we acquired years ago, and, and we still have. Uh, and then the Anubis statue, I think, is from Mummy Returns, the movie? Is that I right? I think it is, yeah. I was that in the... You did the Mummy walk through years ago in years the park. Years ago, yeah. Is that from that? Yes. That's so, from, from it. Both of them actually are. We had the other one up in there as well, uh, the Scorpion yeah. King piece as well. But I think the the alligator heads, I think those are from uh, Skeleton, Skeleton Key. Key. Oh, the yeah. Kate Hudson yeah. movie, Skeleton Key? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so there was all kinds of different, yeah. you know, actual real movie props. We just don't tell anybody ahead of time because no. you steal them. <laughs> and a few Van Helsing tombstones. Yeah, there's some Van Helsing stuff as well. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. In the beginning, the graveyard. So, those two, some of those tombstones, that's from the movie Von Helsing. Every once in a while we get lucky and they yeah. give us free stuff. It, it depends on what the production is and what where it's at, and what they got, you know, and you know what we're offered, what they want to keep, what they don't. So um, you tell them the past, we're able to grab some and hang on to and reuse some, you know, really good pieces. You know? All right, I think it's time. Da -da -da. Um, so we'd like to announce something that we're going to be doing this year. Um, you know, uh, we, we, we listen to everything you guys say. And you guys always, you know, talk to us on social media, on Twitter. And one thing that people have asked a lot about that we just haven't frankly done a lot of, we used to do it in the past, but we haven't done it a lot recently, is um, original mazes. We don't do a lot of that. here. Pat Quinn, where are you? Pat. He's right in the front, right up here. Pat, stand up, take a bow. Pat Quinn. Pat Quinn works with Chris and I, has for years on Halloween Horror Nights. Uh, this was Pat's idea. Pat came to us, he pitched this idea last year. Uh, Pat does all of our scare zones with Chris and I, he does a lot of the park decor you see in the park every single year. If you like the way the park looks, if you like the scare zones, the credit deserve, or belongs to Pat. Um, and he kind of thinks differently than Chris and I, but you know, he came and pitched this idea and immediately I was like, oh yeah, that's a great idea, Pat. And then, yeah, I was just gonna say that tied into like, you know, a few of the other scare zones in the past, like the Dark Christmas one, and um, even I thought like Hell's Harvest in a sense too, where it's kind of like this good gone bad theme, you know, yeah. it's that big twist. Um, and you can tell it works really well. So, um, last year people loved that scare zone. It was um, the highest rated scare zone by, by you, the, the fans and the guests, in the history of Horror Nights. In all the years we've been doing Horror Nights. It was like off the charts. Everybody loved it. So this year we sat down and we went, you know what? That would actually make a really good maze. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you caught it on the video, because that video is obviously all footage of the scare zone last year, because we haven't built it yet, so we can't shoot video of the maze. Uh, but what we are going to do is take you through the maze, if that's okay with you. Uh, we'll show you the character designs, we'll show you some of the elevations. Um, 
And I don't know if you caught the credit at the end, but we have a really good friend who we've worked with, with for a long, long time on music, and his name is Figure. Do you guys know Figure? Um, Figure is, a, is an electronic music artist, sometimes described as a dubstep artist, uh, but what he really specializes in is doing like horror-inspired electronic music. Um, and he did a maze with us years ago called Monsters Remix. He also did the music for our, our face-off maze years ago. And so we called up Figure and asked him, hey, would you like to do the music for this? And then I gave him, much like I did with Slash, I, I pulled all these music examples, like everything from old Al Bully, you know, the guy who did the, some of the old time songs in The Shining, some of his music. And I gave, I gave him all these different music examples to inspire him. And that's what he's doing right now in his studio is writing the music for Holidays in Hell. So it's gonna have a completely original score. Um, but this is the key art, the first key art. We'll have a second round that'll come out with all of the characters. And I think in the house somewhere is the gentleman who designed the key art, I think. If you are, stand up, take a bow. Right yes. there, there we go. Former character, I believe, right? Scarecter last year. Um, and that's the cool thing about Horror Nights. We get to meet great, talented people who are not only performers of ours, and sometimes, you know, we find out that they have other talents. Um, one of Chris's main designers, was a, a character of ours in our thing maze. Yes. His name's Troy, and you've probably seen him walking around Monster Blues. He always wears a fez, yeah. and he has a really long beard. Uh, but Troy, we'll, we'll see a there. few pieces of his. There. Troy, if you're there, yeah. wave. Uh, but, but Troy's now part yeah. of Chris's design team, and he was his character. So it's, it's great that we get to meet these people and work with them, and work with them as talented actors, but sometimes they also transition to become part of our team, too. So that's awesome. So this is the teaser key art, and then we're going to release another version later on that has all of the characters in it. Um, but let's walk you through it. So again, this was the Scare Zone last year. This is Pat Quinn's lineup of characters that we featured in the Scare Zone. But for the maze, where Chris and I really started, and we brought Pat in on this one, so Pat yeah. played a, a big role Absolutely. in designing this maze with us as well. Yes. And Pat's really good at finding weird, messed up yes. stuff. <laughs> and one of the first things Pat brought us is he's like, look at these postcards. And some of them go back to like Victorian times. But have you guys ever done this? Have you ever looked up like old greedy cards and postcards? They're, they're, I can't say it, because I'm gonna say something I should twisted. say. Twisted. Thank you, they're twisted. They're just messed up. Like, I don't know what people were doing in Victorian times, but they certainly weren't raising children. <laughs> you know, that they, they were traumatizing their children. And I'll show you plenty of examples. So we basically, the leaping off point for every one of these scenes was some kind of a post arc. And we're gonna use that as a reoccurring element throughout the maze. In fact, the facade is gonna be a postcard. It's gonna be this big New Year's postcard. And I think I brought it with me, at least the one that inspired it. There it is. Um, yeah, that's the inspiration. That's something completely different than what you guys have seen us usually do. Usually our uh, facades are not graphic pieces. So this is a little bit different. It'll be really cool. It and um, we're gonna, you know, Embrace the idea of, of New Year's Eve, so it's going to be the countdown, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, and then when it's Happy New Year, everything kind of goes bad with the postcard, and it takes on a creepy, scary effect. But some of the some of the characters, oh, forgot about the visual research. So we did a ton of visual research on this, and I'll just explain, you know, some of the images and how they relate to them. Of course, Father Time and Baby New Year, those are going to be characters, I'll show you those in a second. Uh, there's something about the 1920s that is just creepy to me, and I think it's probably because of the movie The Shining, yes. you know, that old music. Uh, just New Year's Eve celebrations in the 20s always spook me out. Uh, I also like the flapper girl in the, in the giant champagne glass, and then Chris designed this. This is actually going to be a, an element you see when you go into the maze. It's going to bubble, and there's going to be, you know, it's going to be like the Lawrence Welk show. There's going to be bubbles everywhere. Yes, it will. Um, we also like the idea of, like, the New Year's baby. There's always, like, in, in small towns, they'd always go, you know, they'd announce who the New Year's baby was, the first baby born after midnight. Um, we also like the idea of doing a nursery. That's Chernobyl, by the way. If you look at that image at the bottom, that's what the, the nursery in Chernobyl looks like now. Um, and... If you look at a lot of old children's art, like Mother Goose, it's jacked up, it's messed up. So we wanted to bring that into it as well. These are all just images we pulled. Um, of course, the Father Time still walking character we had last year, that's the concept art for him. That's the final design. He's gonna be part of this. Um, but we're also gonna have Party Revelers. This is very kind of shining. This is kind of a little bit inspired by the Gold Room and the Shining. This is uh, two of the characters Lucas designed. 
a new character. Yeah, um, she's, she'll be inside the nursery. Yeah, so we're going to take you into a nursery where Baby New Year is born, but it's going to be like a Chernobyl nursery that's been abandoned. There's going to be all this creepy kids art that's peeling off the walls, like old paintings. Um, and then the, the, the wet nurse, or the nightmare nurse, is going to be uh, this lady. That's a new character. Um, oh, yeah. And then we had to have Baby New Year, and you know, we were trying to figure out how to do this, and the, the research that I did that it, I sent to Chris, and he probably thought I was crazy, but there's a, there's a musical that has this song called Triplets. It's an old MGM musical, and it was Fred Astaire. Have you ever seen it where they're like little babies, and they're like kicking their legs? Yeah. And it's all, it's a gag, it's like, you know, they're down, they're really down on their knees. Um, so we decided to do Baby New Year. Yeah, no, I didn't, it. when he sent that to me, I didn't think it was crazy. Because I, I kind of had along the same thoughts in line, you know. I, I, I think um, Shrek and Laura Farquaad on, yeah, and the on, Broadway on, on Broadway, I think the guy's basically on his knees, you know, in a sense. So we were kind of trying to take that idea, and I've seen videos of that, but essentially put him on his back, as you can see, is like Baby New Year, and then work in like a magic illusion gag. So our Baby New Year has a really kind of weird shape to him. It has really long arms. It's like long monkey head. arms. Yeah, and a big head, but then a little body, and little feet, <laughs> little legs. So when uh, Baby New Year is in the bassinet, it should look really great in the water. <laughs> it look really great. I was just thinking about like when we go backstage, I, oh I don't want to really run into sorry. this guy backstage walking around like this. It's just going to be messed up. Yes. Um, and then, of course, we're going to take you into Valentine's Day. If you look at old Valentine's Day greeting cards and postcards or Valentine's cards, they're all violent. I don't know why. It's like, I'm going to cut your heart out for Valentine's Day. And we found all these old creepy postcards. So, you know, there's going to be, we're going to, again, we're going to use the postcards to, like, introduce each scene. Um, and then, of course, this is the visual research we did. Tunnel of love, sweet arts candies, uh, trashy tacky negligees that boyfriends buy their girlfriends for Valentine's Day and think they're actually buying them a gift, but it's really for them. Uh, cheesy prom, like you know, bad, bad like yes. you know, prom attire. Uh, Laugh-in, like the idea of the doors that open up was another idea we had. And then the, the weird statue you see in the Catholic Church, um, that's Saint Sebastian. He's always the saint you see with all the arrows in him. So we kind of took all of that and mixed it together. The idea for this is we're taking you into a tunnel of love, like an old carny tunnel of love. Um, this is our Cupid character from last year. And then, like Valentine's Day present box, it's a, a prom date, it's a, a guy and a girl, shot through with arrows from Cupid. There's a big, huge heart-shaped window behind him. And then Cupid's gonna be basically cutting a live performer, cutting her heart out and ripping it out of her chest. Yeah, it's a little, Little vignette, essentially, of like kind of our own version of a, one of these postcards in three dimensions, basically, in a sense, you know? And then the uh, next section is the section that's going to get me kicked out of my new home country. Because <laughs> there's nothing the Irish like better than when Americans tell them what leprechauns are. You know? Like, the, it's a classic thing, you know, they always go, uh, whenever I come back, they're like, oh, do you eat like Lucky Charm cereal there? Like, no, there's no such thing. You know, even St. Paddy's Day, the way we say it, they, they laugh at us. They think we're silly. It's Paddy with a D. Um, but this is, of course, the leprechaun, the pot of gold. And we thought, well, how can we take that idea and make it scary? So this is the visual research. That weird cave thing you see, that's something you see all over Ireland. They're called fairy caves. And that's illustrations of fairies you see. But fairies are kind of semi-evil characters in Ireland. They're, they're not nice. They do, they're like tricksters and they do evil things. Uh, the image you see it um, tonight, you know, you're going to start watching Game of Thrones again, right? Uh, that's from Game of Thrones. Remember when they poured the molten gold over the guy's head to kill him? Yeah. We thought that was cool. It's gold. Um, that, the houses you see are stuff that I, I, I see all the time in the Irish countryside. You just drive around and find these houses everywhere. They never tear anything down. Um, and there's old, ruined, you know, 200-year-old farmhouses that have, like, live trees growing in the middle of them. And I sent that to you. I remember just taking pictures and going, Chris, check this out. Yeah. Um, and then the bloated guy, uh, there's a well. So the leprechaun, first you're going to go through the fairy tunnel or the fairy cave and see what the evil fairies are doing. Then you're going to come to the leprechaun's house, um, and it's going to very much resemble that ruined Irish farmhouse. This is our oh, leprechaun is. character from last year. And then this oh, is uh, one of Chris's elevations. You can tell us what we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, this is one of the elevations that, which we had mentioned, Troy Zimmerman, he had done off of, of one of my sketches. So what I do is little teeny tiny 
small sketches um, and that I represented this. And what I do is I hand these sketches off to an individual named Brandy Creason, who's uh, in charge of all my show set designers. I've got like six of them or so. So she generates um, all this artwork uh, through all those designers. Um, and then you see the tree yep. popping out of the roof that's you know, yes. growing in the middle of the house. Yeah, we're trying to make a chimney out of that tree popping out. And, and uh, we're trying to get you know a really good feeling of this. To be totally honest with you, this is kind of our own thing. You know, we're pulling like uh, windows. That's like an old window from like a Crimson Peak look, actually. And we're going to take and change that look of that window. Um, to make it more represent um, St. Patty's Day. Actually. And then what the leprechaun's doing is he's yeah. taking all the people who are after his gold, because they're trying to steal the leprechaun's gold, and he's pouring molten gold over them. Yes. So a little Game of Thrones. Yes. All right, Easter. And again, this is just wrong. <laughs> again, these postcards are always the inspiration for all of this stuff. Uh, when we think about Easter, the thing I always think about is all those great pictures you see on the internet of absolutely traumatized children sitting on the lap of freaky Easter bunnies. You know, I grew up in the 1970s, Chris did too, so yeah. malls, you know, photo ops for Easter, and this is basically what we're doing. We're gonna take you into a 1970s creepy, you know, shopping mall Easter bunny photo op, for lack of a better word. Uh, I hate peeps. Peeps are my most hated thing on the universe. I hate them, can't stand them, can't touch them, can't look at them. Just one of my weird phobias that I have, so wanted to work peeps into it. Uh, I found that weird picture of a girl like in an egg and showed it to Chris. And I was like, I don't know what we're gonna do with it, but it's messed up. Oh, yeah, Let's do well, something with it. And then the, the bottom, that's Bunny Man. That's an urban legend about this weird rabbit guy that kills people in the Midwest. And then the idea of an Easter egg hunt. Um, this is our Easter Bunny character from last year. Um, and then just one elevation, just a little slice of what you're gonna see in the Easter section. <laughs> This is those weird, oversized Easter eggs. There's a person that's been entombed in one of them. One of them has a melted, jacked up peep monster coming out of it. Uh, and then another one has our jacked up Easter bunny. And then another one's cracked like a, like a jack-o'-lantern and is lit from the inside. So it's like an Easter egg jack-o'-lantern. Easter Palooza. Fourth of July. Again. Yeah, yeah. Hey kids, here's an idea. <laughs> Why don't you hold these explosives? You know? yeah, yeah. And this is so the inspiration awesome. for you know what we're going to do with Fourth of July. Every postcard you see from Fourth of July, it's always small children handling dangerous explosives. So there's got to be you know a comeuppance for that. Uh, visual research, roadside, middle of nowhere fireworks stands yeah. that we all grew up with. Yes. Creepy CD. I love the one that says smoke shop fireworks. <laughs> it's a recipe for disaster. Um, and, those, and all those old great brands like Black Cat. So we want to take you to a creepy roadside, very patriotic themed uh, fireworks stand that is also like selling cigarettes. So, you know, it's, it's exploding because people are smoking inside it. And so all the fireworks are going off. It's a big visual effects sequence. Um, there's our Uncle Sam character. He's going to be one of the main characters in it. But also we have the fireworks kid, and that's his set piece. So it's all of this exploded, burned, charred fireworks. Uh, with smoke effects and the smell of the, you know, all the scent effects we do for Horror Nights. And then Chris, this is a Chris Williams one. So that's him blown onto uh, all these boxes of fireworks and such. And so that's our firework kit. That's what I imagined uh, some of my buddies. Where I grew up in Northern California, we used to play around with all kinds of- Dangerous uh, fireworks? Yeah, way firecrackers and beyond and 80, all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, that was pretty relevant up there at that time in the 80s and the 70s. I had a guy on our block who, an adult, who stuck an M80 in a metal um, letterbox. Went, hey kids, check this out. And it was like shrapnel. Yeah. You know, literally, it rained shrapnel down on the entire neighborhood. So that's our fireworks yeah. kid. Um, Thanksgiving. Um, when you think about Thanksgiving, if you were a turkey, would you like Thanksgiving? No. No. It's like, you know, the year when all of your brethren are massacred. Year after year after year. And I love this postcard of the kid with the dead turkey. Like, hey, check it out. Um, the main inspiration was Norman Rockwell's painting, you know? Yeah. The classic Thanksgiving painting. And we wanted to make like a 1950s Thanksgiving classic Americana, you know, dinner in, a, in an American home. And then... Uh, there's our turkey character. So basically the turkeys have turned the tables on the humans. They busted in the house and they're murdering everybody with the uh, 
all of the implements you would find on the table. So people drowned in jello molds and you know serving forks impaled on them and meat thermometers. So it's just a bloody massacre. That's just uh, an example of one page of the drawing package with the ground plan and Chris's scenic elevations of the 1950s, you know, Norman Rockwell house. And then last but not least, because I know we got to wrap it up soon, thank you, Perry. Um, Christmas. So the maze ends with Christmas and again, the postcards. If you get anything creepier than that, it's like Peeping Tom Santa <laughs> staring at children. Now he's putting a child in a, in a, a sack and, and then he's calling Hello, children. <laughs> now he's calling their mom. It's just wrong. Yes, sir. Uh, so what we decided for Christmas is we're going to take you to um, a Christmas tree lot, you know? I don't know why, but I grew up with all those horrible flocked Christmas trees, you know? Like in the 70s, they were all like that horrible white flocking stuff that got everywhere. Um, so if you imagine going to one like Santa's Christmas tree lot, except they're covered in blood. Um, and all of the Christmas trees are adorned with like intestines instead of garland, uh, little children's fingers instead of ornaments. Um, that weird, you know, Christmas tree dude inspired a character that, um, we're going to save that one. Yes. Let's not tell anybody about that. You'll see that down the line. Um, but of course where you're going to end up is Santa. And we noticed something. If you just rearrange the letters of the word Santa, you get... Satan! <laughs> so Santa, Satan. Um, and he's going to be the final scene in the maze, but it doesn't end there. Because we also have a scare zone that connects to this maze. This is going to be in our Parisian courtyard location where Universal Monsters was last year. So there's a whole Christmas in Hell themed scare zone. I know we're running close on time, so I'm going to go through it really quick. These are just some of the characters you're going to see. Mrs. Santa Claus, along with Satan Claus. Um, we're bringing back some characters we did for Dark Christmas. So these are a couple of our evil elves from Dark Christmas, along with Jack Frost. And this is a new one. I love this one, The Winter Witch. And then I love this one, too. Oh. Nutcracker Stillwalker. That's a great, that's my favorite. I think that one's going to be really fun. Yeah. And then it all kind of comes full circle, and it wraps up with Baby New Year. He's the end of it. So that's Holidays in Hell. All right. In my hand. I have this lovely commemorative souvenir voucher, good for two front of line tickets to Halloween Horror Nights 2019, and, and bonus, an exclusive behind the scenes maze tour with the creators of Halloween Horror Nights. Who wants to win that? All right, if you guys follow me on Twitter, you know I've been, I did a really evil thing this year. I tweeted hints about the maze, but I released it on April 1st. So I'm sure a whole bunch of me thought that was an April Fool's Day joke. It wasn't, it was real. I was trying to, key you guys in on what the code name of the maze was. And I'm going to reveal what that was. The code name for Halloween, Holidays in Hell is Madonna. Why? Because Madonna's first hit was called Holiday. There are two punk bands that also have the word Holiday in the title of one of their most famous songs. And I'm going to give you a hint. These are old school punk bands. So like our generation, I'm gonna make sure I don't screw this up. Like 70s into early 80s punk bands. So I just want, and we're gonna, as soon as I say this, you're gonna raise your hands, I'm gonna pick one person, and if you get it wrong, I'm gonna tear that up and you get nothing. Okay? No, it's the way it works, kids. I want you to name one of the two punk bands or the song, either one. All right, the first hand I saw go up. Holiday in Cambodia, Dead Kennedys, come on up. Congratulations! I would have also accepted Holidays in the Sun by the Sex Business. There you go. That has the information on there. You email. Our team will put it together. You get two free front-of-line tickets to Halloween Horror Nights, and you get an exclusive behind-the-scenes maze tour. Thank you, man. We'll be seeing you later on in the season. Give it up for us! All right. And I know we're out of time, so we've got to get going. Chris and I are going to be hanging out out front if you guys want to say hi later. Seriously, thank you guys thank for coming you. to Halloween Horror Nights. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Thank, thank you, Chris thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. A whole lot more to come. A lot of exciting mazes to be announced. Stay tuned.